Welcome to another episode of the Latoro Zone podcast. I'm your host, Phil Rowley. The Latoro Zone, or Shoal Area of the Lake, is where the majority of the action takes place. My podcast is intended to do the same. Put you where the action is to help you improve your stillwater fly fishing. On each broadcast, I, along with guests from all over the world, will be providing you with information, tips, tricks, flies, presentation techniques, along with introducing you to different lakes you might want to explore. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Please feel free to email me at flycraft at shaw.ca with your stillwater fly fishing questions and comments. I do my best to answer as many as we can prior to each episode, just before the main content. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy today's show. This is Dave, your Wet Fly Swing podcast host, Phil Roy, back here today for another huge episode of the Latoro Zone. This is our chance to break down stillwater fishing from one of the best so you have the tools you need for success this season. Today's episode is sponsored by Eastern Idaho's Yellowstone Teton Territory, Idaho's most renowned zone for fly fishing, from the Henry's Fork to the South Fork of the Snake, and all the high alpine lakes and streams in between. Yellowstone Teton Territory provides anglers and other outdoor enthusiasts with all the information they need to plan their next big trip. You can visit wetflyswing.com slash Teton right now to get the full list of outfitters, lodges, fly shops, and all kinds of inspiration to get you started on your next trip to Eastern Idaho. That's Teton, T-E-T-O-N, wetflyswing.com slash Teton. Earlier this year, between the Denver and Pleasanton fly fishing shows where I was presenting, I had the opportunity to fish Pyramid Lake once more. I last fished Pyramid Lake in 2011. A few things had changed since this initial visit to this hallowed North American still water. The increased average size of the cutthroat inhabiting pyramid was perhaps the most noticeable change since the reintroduction of the pilot peak strain. For this trip, I was fortunate enough to be the guest of Nico Sonsiri from Pyramid Fly Company. Nico also runs the Bearfish Alliance podcast. I have been fortunate enough to be a guest on Nico's podcast a few times to talk about my stillwater experiences. I was looking forward to this role reversal, having Nico as my guest as he provides a detailed look at Pyramid Lake, including its history, fish species, equipment considerations, and the presentation methods he and his Pyramid Fly Company teammates use daily. If you've ever wanted to fish Pyramid and cross paths with one of its many double-digit cutthroat, today's episode should prove to be a valuable reef source. Let's talk to Nico. Okay, let's jump into this one with Phil and see some magic and a potential mic drop. Here we go. So here we are. We are talking about Pyramid Lake, and in particular with my good friend, Nico Sonsiri. So Nico, where are you from? Where do you well, from? I'm from, well, I live in Reno, Nevada. <laughs> um, and I, I grew up in Southern California. I grew up in uh, San Dimas uh, of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure fame. <laughs> I was literally a kid when they were filming that there. For us not uh, geographically in tune with Southern California, where is that close to? So it's in Los Angeles County. Oh, okay. uh, About 40 or so minutes east of Los Angeles, right? Like, I think we're one town away from the border of San Bernardino County. Okay. And San Dimas was tucked up against the uh, San Gabriel Mountains there, Angeles National Forest. So now you're in Reno. How do you go from Southern California to Reno? (laughs) <laughs> in 3,000 yeah. words or less. <laughs> uh, the easy one is get me out of here. Um, just point me in a direction and I'll go. And Reno is the first place I landed. Uh, no. So um, long story short, age of 17, um, joined the Marine Corps. And I, I thought that was my ticket out of Southern California. But lucky me, I went to basic training. Um at San Diego MCRD (laughs) and then got stationed at Camp Pendleton, which was my last duty station choice. They gave me a list. They gave me like five duty locations um, that I could choose from. And I got Camp Pendleton and I'm like, I wanted to get out of California, but it all, it all worked out. And then at, at that time, my family had relocated 
once I went to basic training, they relocated to North Lake Tahoe. So my residence changed to my home record changed to North Lake Tahoe. So I started taking leave and everything up here. And I thought the place was great. And as a bonus, I grew up watching Bonanza. And Bonanza was old when I was a kid, but I loved it. I loved the whole thing of like the little piece of Lake Tahoe and Carson and Reno and Virginia City. And and I remember telling myself as a kid that I'd love to end up there. And I indirectly kind of ended up here. So it all worked out. <laughs> so that's a long story short of how I got here. <laughs> so how long were you in the service for? A uh, total of uh, 13 years. 13 so, years. So yeah, uh, uh, eight years, United States Marine Corps. About a seven-year break, and then I re-enlisted and ended up on the dark side in the Army for about five years. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was an interesting transition. But the nice thing about that, it was I, I was able to be stationed locally up here, um, you know, Reno, Carson City, Northern Nevada, and, and work this area up here. So that 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 was neat. So. Yeah. And with the Marines, you got to see some of the world, right? <laughs> with the Marine Corps, I got to see the world. I saw a lot of it. I mean, I did make a list up at one time. My wife and kid are asking me, where have you been? And it feels like a short list in your head. And then we start going through all the spots I've been. It's a really long list. And it's funny when you say it out loud of where you've been, you forget that you've been there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, <laughs> you know, and it's especially funny. Like my son's watching TV. He'll see some far away location like one location was mumbai and he's like oh mumbai and i'm like oh yeah i've been there <laughs> he's like, what's that like i'm all it smells bad <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm sure from a marine corps perspective you weren't staying at the hilton any five-star no. accommodation um no. and the places you went not everybody was friendly so <laughs> no no and you know, places like that it's a port of call you know so you yeah. probably have two or three days there so you know the, the fun of it i guess all was you know see something new and see how far 50 bucks could get you in three days. So, <laughs> well, thank you for, thank you for your service, but we're here to, I could talk thank hours you. to you about that, but uh, we're here yes, to talk sir. about uh, fly fishing and in particular Pyramid Lake. Um, yep. So when did you start fly fishing? When did you get that bug like the rest of us? So I was a spin angler, conventional angler ever since I was a little kid. So that goes back to growing up in San Dimas. We had a little uh, puddle down there called Pudding Stone Reservoir. It's a warm water reservoir. Um, so start fishing for all the warm water species in the summers. You had the catfish, you had the largemouth bass, you had the bluegills. In the one month of winter that you got in Southern California, they'd plant trout in there. And that was like my favorite thing, right? You know, go for the trout. Can't wait for winter. Um, so that progressed. Yeah, to where I always had this thing in my head for trout. I always trying to find them, but I got stuck with the warm water in the ocean. Nothing terrible about that. But down there, it was it was more more. Um, you're more focused towards the conventional style of angling, you know, because the types of water that you had. Uh, it wasn't until that I started really prospecting out here in the Eastern Sierra area. Um, in particular, there was a lake up here above Truckee, Prosser Lake. And holy smokes, this is probably, and I guess I'm relatively new to fly angling in some aspects because I didn't start till about, ooh, maybe just 12 years ago. So, so fairly new. And, and the whole reason was I'm fishing this lake and, you know, using the typical little panther martins for the trout. And it's a smallmouth fishery as well. So I'm using grubs and stuff. And then, I'd frequent it in the summer and I would see these amazing hatches coming off the lake. I mean, it literally made the water boil and the boiling was caused by the amount of fish coming up and eating these little bugs popping off the surface. And at that time I had no clue. I'm like, what are these bugs? I, I thought they were mosquitoes or something. So uh, my wife got me a, Christmas gift from Cabela's. She got me one of the entry level kits. She got me like a five weight, nine foot, you know, just basic setup. And I'm like, I got to try this because they're eating all these bugs off the top of the water. And I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know what they're eating. So I go to this fly bin and I'm like completely overwhelmed. I'm like, 
how many bugs are there? Like, <laughs> like bugs and stages and I, of bugs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I saw one that said mosquito. And I'm like, well, there's a lot of mosquitoes out there. That looks good. So I grabbed a couple out there, a couple of those, and then trying doing the Cassie thing. I get it out there, and it sits on top of the water. And then my line goes tight. And I'm like, wow, wow I got one. Then I do it again and again and again. And so my progression strangely enough, started on Stillwater. And, and in a weird way, when you think about Stillwater, you don't think about, for most instances, you don't think about doing a topwater, you know, for trout on Stillwater. Just, but I didn't know that then, so I thought I was doing the coolest thing. And, um, and then I transitioned. It took me a while to go to the river because the river was too daunting. As ironic as that sounds, I'm like, the river, I'm like, I don't get it. There's all this water moving and the fish are moving and i'm like hell at this lake i know where the fish are at all the time i think in my head from all my spin angling experience so i started zeroing in on them and started asking a lot of questions that was a miserable experience because no one could answer the question you know what are they eating what's this bug whatever i found the fly fishing community out here was so focused on the rivers they could tell me everything about the river i'm like well what bugs in that lake you know and what fish is in that lake what are they eating so down the rabbit hole, <laughs> down the rabbit hole. And of course that led eventually to the, um, to the big salty pond out there. Cause I'm like, these fish are cool. And you catch wind of this thing called pyramid in the winter, mm -hmm. you know, like winter, like aren't the lakes frozen over in winter? Oh no. Oh no. And there I went. <laughs> All right. That's cool. It's similar to my experience. You know, mine was fishing rivers and getting fish on a dry fly and then went to lakes. So I understand uh -huh. the same thing as well. Um, so let's talk about the big salty pond, Pyramid Lake. And for yes, those sir. people, the few out there maybe that haven't heard of it before, where exactly is Pyramid Lake? So Pyramid Lake geographically is probably about, uh, as you drive, about 40 minutes northeast of Reno. Um, it is in no man's land. Strangely enough, as close to Reno as it is, it's located on the Pyramid Paiute Indian Reservation. So it's technically it is a sovereign nation out there, and it's going back in time out there. Um, but yeah, it's fairly close to Reno. So, you know, 40 minutes, 30 some miles from the north end of Reno, you know, Sparks area. Um, gosh. And for those that don't know, it is a terminus, um, meaning... It has no water flowing out of it. So all the water it gets, gets from one water source, and that's the Truckee River. And the Truckee River flows out of Lake Tahoe and other tributaries. There's other reservoirs and whatnot that feed it. But the main flow of water is from one, one source of water. So we depend upon that to <laughs> keep it full, which it doesn't have a problem keeping full. <laughs> well, and as, as we both know, I fished it a couple of times, including once with you. And it, it's a pretty special place. But it's big water, isn't it? How how long and wide is that lake? Uh, on average, about thirty by ten. So, so thirty, 30 miles, miles long. long. Yeah, and around its widest part of the belly is around ten miles, just depending on what the water level is. So that's big water. I you you were telling me when we were out there, you've got to be careful and and pick your you know if you're going to head out there in any sort of watercraft, you really got to be careful. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a very misleading lake. Uh, you, you can, if you're doing the boat thing, you could launch early in the morning. It could be nice and calm or, or reasonably calm. And, you know, you want to head to the other side in that matter of turning, you know, heading to the other side, things happen. <laughs> uh, a lot of wind out there. I mean, we're between two mountain ranges, um, and wind never holds a constant direction out there unless there's like some type of system moving in. So you could have a westerly wind at one part of the day and easterly one out of the north and one out of the south all in one day. And it tends to fish pretty good when it gets ugly too, doesn't it? It does. It does. Um, that's the whole thing. A lot of people shy away from still water fisheries when the water gets rough. I mean, I know there's some still water fisheries out here. Other ones where when there's a little bit of chop on the water, the fish go home. They just pack it up and they go in a cage somewhere. <laughs> It's quite the opposite on Pyramid, where we don't look forward to those glassy days. Um, it's not as frequent to have good fishing on those days. 
The only exception would be early and late season when we're fishing deep for them. So that top water action doesn't affect them too much because they're following that thermocline down. Their food's at a different level. But for the rest of the season, we like them in close and nothing drives them in better when that wind's blowing in our face, you know, or from the south or the north or whatever. As long as it's pushing water along the shoreline, it's, it's pushing food in and it'll bring those fish in. And they get close. You know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk about those fish because it's pretty special. So it's home to Lahontan La cutthroat, right? And you've yes, got sir. two strains swimming in that lake. And Correct. Let's tell the listeners about those strains. And, and again, this is what makes Pyramid special. Is cause... Right, right. So we'll, we'll start off with the nickel tour on the strain. So we have what we call a, a summit strain. And then we have the pilot peak. The summit strain has been in that lake since, well, boy, I can't put an exact date on it. So let me back up here. The Pilot Peak was the original strain in that lake. Pilot Peak went extinct in 1943 out of that lake. So it's extinct in Pyramid Lake and the Truckee River. The main cause was commercial fishing, overfishing. So from that point, they looked for a replacement. So what they did is they locally sourced other very similar trout in that same family that lived in other local lakes like Independence, uh, Summit Lake, hence Summit. Mm -hmm. um, I think some came out of Walker and there's some other locations where they pulled these fish together and they were able to tolerate um, the high pH and alkalinity of Pyramid. Um, and they, they filled the gap, right? They did not grow to the size of the pilot peaks. Uh, I think the record was 40 plus pounds. Um, I think back in the 40s or 40s, 30s. And that's a summit strain? And no, that was the pilot peak. Oh, okay, yeah. so, so the summits, the summits, as they started to grow, you know, they started hitting that 10 pound mark, 12 pound mark, you know, maybe a little bit bigger. So your ultimate trophy size fish was scaled down um, from the ability of being like, you know, 20, 30, or even a 40 pound fish. Um, but however, it was still a great fish. It fished well, it performed well. Um, it followed all the same traits as the pilot peak. It ate all the same stuff. So it had a home and that restored the fishery to get people back out there and, you know, have, you know, the ability to have a recreational place to go fish. Um, in the late or the early 2000s, and I'm really like condensing the story here. A miracle happened <laughs> and they were literally able, they ran across what they thought was the pure genetic strain that formerly occupied Pyramid Lake. And they found this strain far away, completely on the other side of the state in the Pilot Peak Range, which borders Nevada and Utah. And that's kind of like, I guess your closest city would be Ely, which is off Highway 50 to give a, a map reference for anybody that wants to look. You can look up Pilot Peak Range and you'll find it, but that's a city reference. Um, somehow, some way ended up out there. There's a bunch of different stories behind that, but the most common one is, hey, there's a rancher and he took some of this stuff out of Pyramid Lake. He saw the overfishing. He took a couple of little small fish with them and some eggs and tossed them up in the Pilot Peak Range. And when they were discovered, they were just like, I mean, compared to the lake fish, they were small, small little fish, but they were very large for the creek that they were in. I mean, they're living in a creek that averaged three CFS. Wow. So the size that they were growing to didn't equate to the body of water that they were in. They're like, this doesn't make sense. Um, some genetic testing was done on that. Luckily, um, some explorers and scientists way back collected samples of the pilot peak before it went extinct and they were scattered across various universities across the U S. So those were all brought in. Um, and by the late nineties actually had the ability to extract the DNA to read the DNA and, and see, yep. Hey, this looks like a 99% match, right? It's about as close as you're going to get. So U S fish and wildlife service ran with that established you know the hatchery and i think it was 2006 they reintroduced them to the lake and they did fantastic they grew at a rapid rate 
I mean, at a really rapid rate. We're catching fish now that in the average of five years will go from a little pup, you know, eight to 12 inches. Uh, we'll catch them 14, 15 pounds. So think about that growth rate. It's pretty fantastic. It far exceeds that of the summit. Um, in our opinion, it's, I feel like it's a healthier fish in the summit. It, that's its home water. And when you catch one compared to a summit, you know the difference at the end of your line. And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of summits out there that are fired up. They're feisty. But in general, that pilot's just got something to it. And it's a beautiful fish. It's a beautiful fish. Yeah, well, that was my experience with our, with our recent trip there was, you know, cutthroat in general. <laughs> cutthroat in general aren't known for, you know, compared to other trout species for their fight. They're certainly beautiful and and they're cooperative. Um, yep. But when I, you know, I was fortunate enough to get a, a pilot peak in that 10, 15 pound range. And and it was different because <laughs> everybody yeah. asked, everybody asked me, how did it pull? And I said, it pulled really well. Um, it, oh. ran, it ran me all over the place. And. I was not in control for most of the fight. Yeah, he gave you he gave you a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. They was he was pass after pass after pass. Yeah. Just like when you when you thought you were gonna bag him, he was like, nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and I think that nope happened about five times at least. Yeah. You're just like, no. Nope. I mean, I can visually remember that. Like I remember seeing him literally at your feet, like cutting left and right and like right there. And he's just like, Yeah, I'm gonna go back out. And, yeah. Well, that's what when when pyramid started you know, the, in recent years, last five, 10 years, it's become a really popular destination. Um, yes. and you know, in my time before there was, it was pre pilot peak. So I was, you know, what, where did all these 15, 20, 22, 25 pound fish I was seeing, where are they coming from? Right. What happened, uh, <laughs> since the last time I'm fishing? And of course you filled me in. So you've got other fish in there as well, which help, you know, provide a source yes. of nourishment. So you've got two each up in there, Correct. Uh, Sacramento perch, and yes, sir. What is it? What's the kiwi? Kiwi, right? The protectors. It's a sucker, isn't it? It's a sucker fish. It's endangered and it's endemic to that lake. So it's the only place in the world where you find the kiwi. Um, it is a sucker fish. Um, interesting looking little fellow. And I think, I think you got to see one. I think Taylor I did. caught one. Taylor caught one. It is not a common catch. Like one hundred percent. Like it. It happens rarely. And. You know, they don't want you to take him out of the water and yada, yada. So we got we got a quick glimpse and he, he sent it on its way. But, yeah, that's it's unique. So uh, Tui Chub is the primary food source for those cutthroat trout for both uh, strains. Um, Tui Chub, uh, if you want to try to visualize it, it's just like your typical little bait fish, you know, silvery gold, you know, greenish, being super tiny to, you know, going up to 18 inches or so. Right. Yeah. And. That's their primary food source, and they live in massive schools, especially in the warm summer months when they try to spawn and and whatnot. Massive schools, like ocean sized schools, like we'll be out there and our water masters, and we'll have our fish finders on, and we'll be in you know let's say we're in thirty five forty feet of water, we'll get a false bottom reading of like five feet, hmm. and you look down and you see all this shiny stuff, and you're like unbelievable, and that's all it's. I'll tell you what, it's a great time. You drop a jig down there. Um, and yes, we do jig on the fly rods. You drop a jig down there and you drop it through that school and you get underneath it and you start lifting up. The majority of the time, something yanks back and ferociously. Yeah, I and bet. ferociously. Like it's unbelievable. Like last thing you think of is that there's a trout at the end of the line. They just go for it. They are fired up that time of year. I bet I, I've seen some drone footage of big pilots. Mm -hmm. They've got chub all balled up like you'd see on the ocean and just slashing through them, got them pushed up against the shoreline and just yep. going crazy. And it's just something to see a fish. Because I remember yep. whoever I was watching, it said those two each other were in the six to eight inch range. And yes. this shark like thing comes roaring through that's 10 times as big as that. Just a, a massive fish. Yeah, the, the, the behavior is very similar to if you watch something like on National Geographic or something where they're showing, uh, you know, like when dolphins attack schools of tuna or, you know, orcas do it or how seals do it, how they'll they'll circle the bait balls, they'll make them bait ball up and then they'll start taking turns charging through them like torpedoes. 
that's exactly what they do. It's a very, it's a very awesome, like Andronimus behavior. And it's nothing like I think you'll ever see in any other freshwater environment. I could be wrong, at least in North America, you just, you just don't see that or don't think about that. It's, it's, it's fascinating. So that's the two each of uh, Sacramento perch are in there. Um, yeah, I think the cutthroat do go for them, uh, but they got their own little, they got their own little sect out there. They, they're mysterious. They'll kind of pop in and out. Definitely not as plentiful as the two each of, but that would be when they're fry and the fry are out, those cutthroat would definitely go search out and find those guys. Um, there's some Tahoe suckers in there, some red side suckers. These are in much smaller numbers and they're all fed in from the Truckee river. So they're not as numerous, but they're there. And then back, of course, the, the Kiwi, um, those Kiwi, you'll find them all over the lake, uh, but we tend to find them generally more South where the um, Truckee river lets in. We have more um, productivity with that color pattern let's say on leeches and jigs and stuff on the Southern side versus the Northern side for the most part. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it for your, your bait fish. So you got cutthroat trout, a bunch of bait fish. And then at this time of the year, cause we're in April now, uh, it's just, it's coronamids. Oh, darn. <laughs> coronamids, coronamids. When you were out, you're out in February, it was coronamids. Yeah. So we, we get this, we get these few months where, they seem to completely switch a majority of their diet to coronamids. So their minority diet will be the bait fish because the bait fish are a lot harder to find. The water's cold. They're scattered. Um, not as easy to hunt, but those coronamids, as you know, in yeah. any of these Western Stillwater lakes, they sit there and they'll just cloud up. There's here comes this cloud of coronamid yum, yum. And they just come on through and they just, they gorge on them. They gorge on them. Yeah, I think that was impressive because that big fish I got was on about a size 10 or 12 coronamid pupa. You know, I think you're on a 12. Yeah. yeah. So people that think, oh, big fly, big fish, not always the case. Thanks. Yeah. No, 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 no. All the big fish so far this season, um, like Morgan, he's he's our lead guide at Pyramid Flyco, which I know we'll touch on, but he got his personal best and – he was danger close to that thing being 25 pounds. Um, if it gulped a couple hundred more bugs or maybe one little bait fish, he might've been right there, but uh, he was about, yeah, close to 25 on a size. Heck, I think he might've been on a size 14 or so, hmm. yeah. you know, and I, I had the same thing last week. I got into uh, danger close to a 21 on a minute little midge just hanging on for dear life right here on the front lip. I mean, the thing comes in the net and just, boop, it falls out and you're, and you, you just don't think that why, why would a fish that big eat something so small? Well, the answer is because they're so plentiful. They're so easy to get. They just open their mouth and they, Oh, there they are. Boom. Yep. And then yep. Nail them. Nail so them. what's the methods then? What should, if somebody's coming out there to fish, what should they bring? What, um, from a, both fishing under an indicator like we did for the most part, cause it was so cool and also stripping. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so, so probably one of the most, the, the, the favorite way, my favorite way to fish for them is under an indicator. Like there's no question about it. There's just something about indicator fishing out there. That's really, really special. Um, number one, the number one reason I recommend the indicator method, especially for somebody coming out that, hasn't fished it before or has struggled to fish out there is because that amount of time that you're in that fishing zone, you're in that feeding lane that whole time that that bobber is out there the whole time. Um, so I would say number one, be indicator. And depending on the time of year, of course, like this time of year, we're on midges, but early season um, up and through December and a little bit of January, we're on leeches. You know, so we're, we're fishing those leeches very similar to the way that we would fish the midges, you know, when it comes to depths and, and whatnot. But, you know, one leech, two leeches, um, and, you know, we'll play around with those those leeches. It'll make them swim a little bit. So like your figure eight technique. Yeah. That's a great way to get them, you know, especially, you know, if the bite's a little stagnant, you know, use a little figure eight, give them a little bit of movement. Other times there's enough wave movement out there. They move by themselves. You don't have to do anything. Just let that thing just 
rock and roll. You know, it rides the current, rides the waves, and it's got plenty of action. So uh, bounce leeches, super popular. Um, midges, super popular. Um, but that does bring up stripping um, and throwing streamers and beetles. Now, that is also an effective way to get their attention. In my opinion, there's certain times of year where that works better than others. Um, when that is, is dictated by how that season is performing. <laughs> if I stuck it to a calendar and said, hey, this time of year you're going to be stripping, it's not going to be the same next year. Um, so you got to remember they're Andronomous fish. So most of that strip bite is going to be very reactionary, mm -hmm. right? So your color schemes change, right? So like with our beetles, uh, Pyramid Lake is probably really popular for the use of beetles. So, you know, little foam bodied, uh, chenille, you know, underbody on a sinking line, you know, run them single or in tandem or run them like with, a, you know, conjunction with the streamer. And we're hucking that out there as far as we can. We get it on the bottom and we strip it in. It might be fast. It might be slow. You might be jerking. It just depends on water temperature and their feeding behavior. Now that isn't exhilarating to catch a fish because they hit it. It's like, it's game on. So they catch you by surprise. The only disadvantage is that less time in that zone. So we all know this with lake fish, lake fish move, they move, 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 move. You're more prone to get their attention by something sitting in their feeding column versus stripping it by really quick. You know, think of it as like Frogger, yeah. right? You know, so we're, we're casting this across the street and we're hoping we're catching, we're, we're hoping we're in front of them right when they come by, yeah. you know, versus the indicator was just sitting there. It is a matter of like, when will they come by or did I miss them? You know, but there are times when they go on a feeding frenzy, especially like post spawn, which we're kind of closing in on now, you know, April, May timeframe. Um, those start eating again. They, they can start getting hungry. The water temperatures come up. They're post spawn. They're a little bit skinnier. So anything that's moving, they're putting their mouth on it. You know, that's moving crap, you know, hit it, hit it. So it opens up the range of like colors you can use. You know, it's like this doesn't look natural, you know, Perfect. Use it. <laughs> It'll get their attention. <laughs> yeah. So lines, obviously, with the indicators, we're using floating line setups. And I know you do it a little differently out there than yep. most of the still waters, probably all of the still waters I've fished before. We'll circle back around to that. But what sort of sinking lines are we are we talking about? Uh, so it's all a matter of preference. I would say my number one recommendation is somebody coming out. If you had to bring one strip rod, you'd probably be best off if you had like something in the sink five rate. Um, cause generally when we're stripping, we're stripping on shallower beaches, um, for a majority of the season, early season, you might be stripping deeper water. You could call for, you know, deeper sinking lines, but, a a sink five is nice. Um, you know, using an unweighted, you know, woolly bugger, um, or woolly worm and then, you know, and a beetle, you know, or beetles in tandem, you know, we're, we're throwing relatively light and smaller stuff out there, um, so sink five helps you get to the bottom and we literally try to drag that stuff along the bottom. They'll come up and scoop it up. They'll put their nose in the dirt and grab it. Um, believe it or not, they're, <laughs> they're scavengers. They really are. They just, anything that moves, they'll go for it. Um, so that would be my recommendation on, on the strip rods and rod size. Um, definitely at least, at least an eight weight. Um, you can go heavier if you like. The reason for that is one, those fish hit hard. Um, you are casting a heavier, you know, sinking line. Uh, and if you're a stripping or, a, you know, a streamer fanatic, you're going to be casting all day. So you want to put a tool in your hand that hopefully is not going to burn you out by the end of the day. Plus you've got that wind you mentioned too, right? That's... <laughs> 100 yeah, percent the, the wind's a big factor so defeating the wind so it's kind of like half and half you want to gear it towards the fish um, but you also gear it towards the elements you know defeat the elements if you have to um so definitely but i i wouldn't be afraid i've seen guys out there nine and ten weights you know and you can keep those in nine foot rods you know keep it easy um ten foot rod goes a long way out there on the strip game uh just a little bit more leverage a little bit more reach um and just that much less effort that you have to put into it on casting so if you are trying to narrow it down don't be afraid to grab a 10 foot like 10 foot eight weight you'd be glad you did you'd be surprised you can send stuff what about the floating line stuff a little get a little lighter 
Uh, no, a little bit. <laughs> seven, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's seven. What, that's what you you let me play with a seven. You kind of. I did. I did. You did snicker quietly as you walked away. <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. Phil handle that thing. Uh, worked. Um. Good. But you mentioned, and I said, we'll circle around. You guys fish a little differently out there with switch setups, right? Which is, yes, sir. which for me is unique because most of the lakes I fish, any kind of, um, you know, where you're trying to throw a traditional kind of spade cast that could create the rat tail and all that would spook fish, but it doesn't seem to, the those pyramid fish don't seem to mind. And you fish your, your indicators a lot further out than I usually uh, advocate because uh but those fish when they pull it down it goes down so you can see it it's just a question can you can you set fast enough so i, I strip I strip little... strip strip yep <laughs> yeah. so why don't you walk uh listeners through your, your your setups you use with the switch rod sure absolutely so our common switch rod setup would be a seven weight is probably one of our favorites it's the most common that we'll use so a seven weight uh we couple that with a very large arbor reel so anything like if i give you a reference let's say it's a like a reddington reel right just off the top of my head like a reddington rise or something so you're like i'm looking at a reddington rise it's like okay well that's going to be a 910 so keep that in your head so whatever your favorite reel is you want a large arbor something feel like you're going to go saltwater fishing and why do we do that well it's the nature of the line we use for one we're big fans of the Rio Chucker line. So the elite, was it the elite Rio gold or is it elite Rio Chucker line? It's yeah, the newest. It's Chucker, elite. Yeah. It says elite on it. So it's, it's the newest one out there. So it's elite Chucker line um, and seven weight on that. And then we do couple it with a Mao tip. Um, Mao tip, heavy 10 foot. Floating. That ge- yeah, floating. Yeah. Craig, I don't get sink. Yeah. yeah, you could get sinking, but <laughs> that'd be weird. Get floating. <laughs> Um, with that, and then our leader setups, um, uh, gosh, it varies from, for a lot of people. I go, I go with the leader setup, like 15 to 17 pounds on average, you know, six feet long, seven feet long, um, to a quality barrel swivel. Don't go cheap on those. Um, and then your tippet or the line below your swivel, whatever you want to call it, um, that's going to range. That's going to be 8, 10, 12 pound, you know, on the indicator set, depending on the conditions, depending on what you're hanging underneath, you know, um, that swivel. You know, if it's leeches, you're probably going to be a little bit heavier. You're probably going to be in that 12 pound range. You know, midges, you'll scale down a little bit, right? You know, the 10, maybe 8 if you're brave um, or lighter if you're really, really brave. But um, <laughs> we, we don't have to worry about those fish being line shy out there. and We can touch on that. So back to the point why do we use this is one is because they're easy to cast number one they're very easy to cast um if you have to mend your line for whatever reason they're easier to mend um easier pickup you can pick up a lot of line really quick with an 11 to 11 and a half foot rod um and then probably number one is that we roll cast we don't there's no backhanded casting out there we can't get into that. Number one reason is because of the wind. We're constantly dealing with the wind. Now, a skilled angler can navigate the wind to a certain degree, right? A skilled angler can still get knotted up or nested up, or whatever. By roll casting, we keep that whole presentation right in front of us all the time. So that helps us not only eliminate any safety issues behind us because we're normally butted up to a beach. So anybody walking behind us or whatever, they're not in the danger zone. We're not getting caught up on the shoreline behind us. We're not killing midges behind us. Midges are precious and leeches are precious. Those painted heads come off real quick when you whack them on a rock. Your wire comes off real quick, you know, or your rigs completely disappear and you don't know it. You're casting, whack, it hits a rock and you cast out there. I'm not catching anything and you bring it in. You're like, oh, where'd all my stuff go? Oh, it's right behind you, pal, you know, and the rocks there somewhere. Um, so it keeps everything in front of you and way less frequency of tangling up because the way everything rolls out. Um, and we can reach the fish too with ease. So like you said, you noticed there was some instances where we're really putting it out there, like really putting it out there 
we're trying to hit feeding lanes that may be 60, 70, 80 feet out there. And, and like you said, <laughs> against better judgment, it's probably not the wisest thing to do, but that's where the fish are at. So again, with that bigger rod, you get a lot more line pickup and, you know, sit there and there's a lot of stripping involved. There's, there's no putting those fish on the reel right away. That's probably one of the number one ways out there to lose a fish is I see anglers and I've been guilty of it. <laughs> um, indicator goes down, boom. The first thing you're thinking of, oh, I got a reel. And you got, you know, you got 10 feet or 15 feet of slack sitting there. And you're like trying to reel, like pinch it off and like trying to reel this up. In the meantime, you got 60 feet of line out there and the fish turns left and right up and down and he's off, you know, versus yeah. just line management. You just strip that in. So, I mean, I'd probably tell you with that switch rod, because of the leverage it has, probably about... 90% of the fish that I land are all by hand. They'll never make it to the reel. Quick break for a word from our sponsor. With over 40 years of experience in coffee, the Angler's Coffee team is here to serve you every step of the way, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. They are responsibly sourced from farms using sustainable growing practices. You can rest easy knowing you are doing your part. And uh, like I've said before, they roast it and they ship it within 48 hours, 48 hours. And you know, um, I'm actually drinking coffee right now and it's super late in the evening and I've got that thing where I can drink coffee and still sleep. Raise your hand if you're like me, but I definitely love coffee and anglers is the coffee that I love most and, uh, and it's no brainer. Anglers is doing good stuff, giving back to great companies uh, great fly fishing companies, great conservation groups, and they have probably the best coffee out there. So it's a pretty easy call. If you want to um, step it up a bit, this is it. This is a pretty easy one to do. This is like, um, this is kind of like your 1% for the planet, anglers, coffee style. With a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go, tea bag option, and a rose sampler, you know, Joe. And the anglers team has you covered. This time, step up to better coffee and more impact for the fish species and causes we all love. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash anglers right now to get a great bag of greatness to your door. That's anglers, A-N-G-L-E-R-S. Let's make a change today for great coffee. How long is your switch rods? You were... I was using a 10-3 just single hand with the outbound short and that that was okay it worked it, it's the same stuff I it use in Ar it's the same setup i use in argentina and, yep. <laughs> and i gotta tell you just a little sidebar looking around the you know the, the look of pyramid is very reminiscent of jurassic lake that uh, <laughs> yep. not a lot not a lot of uh, vegetation with high vertical growth <laughs> everything short right. and scrub which is usually right. a clue i think it blows a lot around here <laughs> that's one yeah, but believe it or not, there really isn't too much of a shortage of precipitation out there. But number one, it's the wind. Yeah, I mean, looking at it, it'd be like, it never rains out here. No, it, it, trust me, when it gets weather when it's supposed to get weather. Well, we had most of you, I've never, I, I have never been in a blizzard <laughs> and a sandstorm at the same time. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was incredible. We had to point the vehicle into the wind so the rods wouldn't rip off the top That's right. of the car. Yeah, we had so the. The wind was picking up so much sand, and we had that snow squall come in. The two of us yep. were looking at each other like, "We're out of here." <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was ferocious. Um, so anyway, I forgot to get your answer on the length of the uh, the switch rod. Oh, correct. So uh, eleven foot six is preferred. Okay, all right. Um, so I would say like eleven three, eleven six. Um, eleven footers work. Um, you just get that much more out of the eleven six out there. Um, however. I will pedal back a little bit and I'll tell you like with that, the 10 foot three is a blast in close. So recently those fish have been in a little bit closer. Um, and I pair that up just the same. I pair it up with the same exact line that, uh, the, you know, the Rio chucker with the tip and everything that we put on the switch rods. Um, so I use that for the close game and like the mystic, like the mystic rods. So Mystic M series, 10 foot three, that's exactly what I landed that 21 pounder on recently was on that 10 foot three rod. Jeff will be thrilled to hear that. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, trust me, I already told him. He was <laughs> – we already told Jeff. But what a fantastic rod. You know, what a fantastic rod. So um, you do have options out there. You just have to look at, you know, how often do I fish it? What are my limitations? You know, can I afford a, a huge quiver of rods or whatever? If you, if you have – if you can afford a bunch of different rods, man, go for the gamut. I mean, I got them. I got, you know, three eleven sixes. I got an 11 footer. I got the 10 foot three. Um, I'll even play with five weights out there in late spring when they come in real close, you know, I'll play with the five weight switches. Cause you have plenty of power in those as well. Um, so you got a wide range. You just got to keep it longer. Come out there with a nine foot. You're going to struggle. You get a decent sized fish on a on a nine foot rod, um, you're gonna struggle. You're gonna struggle. Based on that laundry list of rods, you just you've come a long way since your nine foot five weight Cabela's starter one, haven't you? <laughs> I have. <laughs> I have it's crazy to think about. <laughs> and for those who don't know who Jeff is, we're referring to having this sort of <laughs> joke. That's Jeff Brady, <laughs> the owner of Mystic Fly Rods, <laughs> a great product. Mm-hmm. So no discussion or talk about pyramid would be complete without discussing ladders and ladder chairs. Because again, that is a <laughs> yeah. another unique thing. Um, you know, the first time I went out there, you know, pre-pilot peak reintroduction, uh, that was unique. Everybody had their own ladder technology and ladder secrets. And I know we'll get to pyramid fly company in a bit, um, but you guys have uh, those ladder chairs, which are, yes. I, everybody asked me what it was like. And I said, it's a bit like sitting in a half sunk boat. <laughs> because you're sitting in a chair yet yep. there's water all around you like the boat somewhat got flooded but your fishing addiction says well we're not sinking so let's keep fishing so you know um how did those come to be why are they so popular at certain spots on pyramid so it started off with crates a long time ago crates were the way to go like a milk crate and well why a milk crate or why anything to stand on out there um why not just stand on the shore? Well, that's a great question. There's a few spots out there you could stand from the shore and, you know, access deep water. Um, but that's not a majority of the beaches. So we have to take into account the underwater features at Pyramid Lake. Um, number one feature, sand. Number two feature, rocks. <laughs> number three feature, a lot of water. And more, rocks. and more rocks and more rocks. <laughs> more rocks. That's it. Yeah. You know, th- there is some underwater vegetation, but not a ton. Um, so what does that mean? You're like, well, um, that means these fish are le- left left with limited structure. So one of their number one favorite pieces of structure are the ledges, right? So what we try to do is we try to catch those fish at the ledges because they like to sit. They do their little ambush patrols, so they'll sit you know, whatever their quote unquote feeding column is. So they, they're swimming at eight or nine or 10 feet today, you know, or maybe they're at 12 feet coming up to nine to hit bait fish or hit chronomids. Well, all those, all that bait will sit in those safe zones, right? Whether they're bugs or fish will sit in the safe zones. Those safe zones tend to be around those ledges or on the backside of that ledge. Cause that's the only thing they have to run to or run away from. So what the chairs allow us to do is one, get in that water and get closer to that actual feature. Cause sometimes those features, like I said, from the shoreline are right in front of us. So we could sit with our toes in the water, cast 30 feet and be at 16 feet deep. Cool. But the rest of the lake is not like that. And the fish don't hang out in that one cool little drop off zone all the time. And that ledge could be 50 yards out. That ledge could be a hundred yards out. I don't know who's casting like that on a daily basis casting that far not me. so right so we get out and we get on the fish right so try to put ourselves on the fish the unique underwater features of pyramid allow us to do this a lot of lakes you can't do that because the shorelines are just this boggy nasty weedy uh vegetation yeah filled. if you tried that my local lakes your ladder would be up to the top rung your chair would be in the muck it just wouldn't support right. it wouldn't support the ladder's weight, never mind your weight as an angler. So that's what makes it so unique. Right. So that's that's the number one reason. It puts us on top of the fish, right? So we take advantage of that. The other advantage is one is the ladder chair keeps you out of the water. We're fishing pyramid a majority of the time in cold weather. 
not warm weather. We have October, which the season starts in October. Those first couple of weeks are nice and warm, right? You know, I mean, it's t-shirt and short weather out there, you know. Um, you head into November, things starting to change. It starts getting colder. That water starts getting colder. December, December's December. December's cold. <laughs> January's cold. February's cold. March is cold. April, well, like today, it's nice, you know, but <laughs> that water is still, right now, it's probably 48 degrees. Um, there's long days at Pyramid. Uh, yeah, you could fish short sessions out there, but a majority of people are fishing sunrise to sunset. Sunrise to sunset, standing in 40 or even 50 degrees some water, even in waders, is not It's not fun. No. no, really, it's not. So it keeps you out of the water. And then one, you're at a higher vantage point, too, for um, you know a little bit better casting angle You know, by being literally on top of the water versus being in the water and casting. Being on top of the water gives you some advantages. It gives you advantages on casting. It gives you advantages on hook set, and it gives you advantages on visibility. And we're not necessarily sight fishing out there, but heck, like if we're indicator fishing, we got way better visibility on that indicator, right? We got way more control over that indicator because we can put that rod tip down without that rod tip being in the water because we're in the water, we're out of the water, rod tips out of the water. We can control those movements. If we want to do figure eights, if we want to twitch it, if we want to correct our drift. So a lot more goes into the line management aspect as well, you know? Um, but I guess overall, the best thing about it is just the comfort factor. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes sense. And uh, so you ran through the seasons a little bit. So there is a closure. So why don't you run me through the seasons and, and what's, if somebody was to come down, what's the best time to come in your opinion? I know anytime, oh boy. <laughs> anytime. Oh boy. What, let's say what some of your personal favorites. Sure. Um, so the season, October 1 through June 30th, um, October 1, is always a great day because it's opener and it's always great because the fish are usually on they're hungry they've been eating uh they're into those bait fish and you haven't been on the lake in months or even longer so it's always a it's a little bit of a circus out there everybody knocking the rust off um i would say probably the most popular month out there no doubt about it is march period now is that the best month to fish? That's debatable. Um, traditionally, that's the most productive month. The fish are in close. There's almost a guarantee that they're in close. We know what they're eating that time of the year, always. Uh, we could drill down on colors and depths a lot easier. Um, but the months leading up to that could be great. Like this past February was fantastic. February is a great time to come out. January is a great time. It's a lot slower but they're still on leeches. They're like on leeches and midges. So you can like get them both ways. And there's big fish in January and there's big fish in February. Um, there's more fish in March. So your mix up's different. I won't say there's less big fish in March, but there's more of every size. So you're getting into all of them. April is a great month. April can almost mirror March. May things start to change a little bit. Uh, we get a lot more like plant growth and allergy growth. So it becomes a little bit, more difficult to fish from the shore like mid month to late month sometimes and that's when we go back out on like the water masters like we do in october um and you know fish a little bit deeper for them some more like may june you could do like some deep water bobber techniques or go back to the jig and stuff like that but i had to say if you wanted to set a plan you're like i want to go to pyramid number one i would say plan something between february and april february and april if you like fishing off watercraft, off like the water masters, can't be an opener. Those first three weeks, three weeks of October are just fantastic. Um, but it's crowded because everyone's excited that it's open. So it's typical opening day anywhere in the popular water, right? Everybody. Oh yeah. There. Yeah. Yes. But you can, you can replicate that fun in October by coming out like late May, all the way through June. Cause guess what? Everybody forgets that pyramid Lake exists like mid May, the Lake, just like disappears off the map <laughs> just goes away is that because rivers like the Truckee are now open and places well, like that, yeah. or everybody's just scattering to other waters well it's summer you know and then you have yeah and other waters are open so all like out here all the eastern sierra is open a majority of the people that come to our lake are coming from out of state so maybe their home water is open you know if they're coming out of the u.s you know they're coming out of colorado they're coming out of idaho or you know montana wyoming or 
your neck of the woods. If they're coming in from BC and Alberta, well, what the heck? They want to be there because you're on you're on the thaw, right? You know, not, not even close. But yeah, when I was well, down there in February, we were locked tight. And yep. ironically, I ran into another Canadian angler down there who was yeah. doing the same thing. <laughs> small world scenario. So yeah, for oh, us, yeah. I, I did get the joy of coming back and and saying I'd fish pyramid with you and that I had caught my first stillwater fish of the season in mid February while everybody else was still staring out the window, wondering if the snow and the ice would ever, <laughs> and the low temperatures would ever stop. So, so your love of pyramid and fly fishing led you to pyramid fly company. Tell our listeners a little bit about that. What's that all about? So, yeah. So pyramid fly co um, we've been out there for what about, I think it was six seasons now. And I've known them for a few seasons. I know Captain Rob over there for a few seasons. And um, my little sideshow is is the Bearfish Alliance, right? I have my little fly fishing brokerage. And, you know, sometimes I guide in California to, and I have this whole podcast thing. And those things kind of, kind of pointed me towards Pyramid Flyco. There were so many similarities and through our, our friendship evolved into, hey, why don't we just team up, you know? And Captain Rob was like, hey, just, hey, why don't you join the team? And let's do cool things. And they were already doing cool things, but he wanted to do more cool things. So let's do it. So I hopped on board, not as a guide. I mean, we have three guides out there. We have, we got Morgan Kane. He's the lead guide. We got Trevor Herring, which... Trevor, he's awesome. He loves you, man. <laughs> Feelings <laughs> mutual. Trevor's a cool dude. Yeah. Right, Trevor. And can't leave out Haas and, and Red. So Haas are his two hunting dogs. Haas is his, his, his hunting dog. And then he's got Red as a brand new um, brand new little pup, a black lab. And then we have Cole Hildahl, which is our young gun. Yeah. Um, and he's an amazing fisherman. Um, so we got three guys out there now. And then we'll have an addition of a new guy next year as well. So we're going to have four. So, you know, where did I fit in and on this? I came on board as the executive officer. Quite a title, right? Sounds For an impressive. outfitting company. <laughs> Sounds impressive. Yeah. However, you know, running an operation such as Pyramid Flyco, I don't think it is what people think. I think people may have this misconception that it's like, hey, there's a bunch of guides out there and I could call them and then I could book a date. Like it's far beyond that. There's so much behind the scenes work that occurs running a fly fishing operation to some people might be mind blowing for those that know you already know. Right. But it's just like any business. It's like, you know, we have a team to support, you know, my team relies on everything that captain Rob does and what I help with to make a living. Right. They have a fantastic job with one of the best jobs in the world to get be an awesome place and help other people fish, but everything else behind that, like, you know, there's gear, there's equipment, there's food, there's housing. Um, the list goes on and on. All of our industry connections, all of our community connections. Um, there has to be uh, a binding agent behind that, you know, to keep everything going. Um, and during the season and off season. So I'm fortunate enough to be on the team to help assist with that. Um, because Captain Rob is phenomenal and awesome as he is. He's got a lot on his hands. You know, he's got full time work and I have full time work. So we take we take the full time schedules and take both of our part time schedules. Da, 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 you know, and try to and try to make and try to make some magic. But our number one goal out there, is, aside from all that, is just to have fun. Number one, to have fun. We want anybody coming out with Pyramid Flyco to have fun, regardless of how the fishing is. It could be the best fishing day in the world. Or it could just be like the roughest fishing day in the world. We want people to walk away going, man, I had a great time and leave with a smile on their face. We want them to come back. You know, we love repeat customers. It keeps us going, but we love having those people back because we reminisce on their, their memories. I mean, part, all of us like live vicariously through our clients because when they have a good time, we're having a good time. And that's number one is just, just having fun. So it's, Fun making fun. <laughs> so what do, what do you guys provide for them? I know you, you've got a full suite of ladders. You've got your water masters. Yep. They basically just have to show up with um, 
with the appropriate clothing, because you've even got rods and reels for them if they need it too, don't you? Phil, it's show up and blow up. <laughs> I like show that. up and blow up. So, <laughs> yeah, you're correct. So we have everything for the client. If you have your own waders, if you have your own rod and reel and you want to bring that out, great, but don't. Bring your waders, bring a good attitude. We got everything else. We have all the rods and reels for you. We have all the tackle for you. We got the chairs for you. Um, we got the food for you. We're feeding you breakfast and lunch. Um, and pretty good. What else do we do? Pretty good yeah. breakfast and lunch, especially the you know, on, on the shore tailgate lunch. Uh, pretty special. And, and, and not just your average, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. We're talking. No, we're talking. You sent me a picture of crab, um, you know, <laughs> hot dogs, um, Bank stage. Oh, we've done we've done all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, and we have we have a standard out there. So we'll we'll do a standard we'll do a standard breakfast and we'll do a standard lunch. And when I mean standard, I mean it's you know we'll cook you like a really great burger. We got you know custom sausages we'll make. We got um, you know we even bring out the organic free range chickens. Uh, we'll get crazy. We've done oysters a few times out there. We've done chili out there. Um, you were there. Jason yeah. was out there. My buddy Jason. He owns Longboard's Pizza. He he makes a mean chili, yeah, and we had it. we'd eat. Remember, we I think we eaten already, and then he's like, "I got chili," and we just kept eating. I think yeah. we had more food that day than. And it was good chili. It wasn't. I was. I'll tell you, I was a little nervous. As a, you know, I I know you, you know, I've appeared on your podcast as well, and you you've got your burrito question, and uh, I have yep. to admit, in Canada, I'm burrito challenged, so I was expecting that pizza to half. Uh, sorry, that chili to half blow my head off, but it was really good. It really hit the spot. So. Uh, pass on my compliments. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, and we did the crab feed. We did a little team and and friend crab feed. We do fun stuff like that. We even have clients. They'll bring out. Trevor makes a, a mean steak. I call it, you know, a steak a la Trevor, and he does this awesome little cast iron steak. You know, when he's in the mood, you know, that's awesome. So we'll, we'll spoil you on food because I mean we think that's an essential part of the experience. Um, we want to keep you fed and happy because we can't control the fishing conditions out there, but we can work with everything else. Right. And the last thing we need is for folks to lose focus and motivation because they're sitting there on an empty stomach. I mean, there's nothing worse. You're like, man, I had breakfast at six or six thirty AM. Now it's like 10 30, 11 o'clock. My stomach's growling. I've been out here in the wind, you know, and it was 28 degrees this morning. And, you know, now it's like 36 and, I'm freezing and, you know, I've seen my bobber go down a couple times, but I've been too cold to set the hook, you know, <laughs> they start getting grouchy, right? They start getting grouchy. Um, you put food in their belly and it's almost like a miracle. It's like this miracle thing where a big majority of the time you get off that chair or you walk off that beach, you come up and you have lunch with us and you go back down. Someone catches a fish. Yeah. Someone catches a fish. It's crazy. It's like, take a break, refocus, re-energize. Forget about everything. Eat food. Talk a little crap to everybody. Go back on the chair. Something happens, and you're refreshed. You're like, "All right, here we go again. Here we go again." So yeah, that that food is a uh, integral part. <laughs> yes, and you're with the proximity to Reno too. You're able to put together packages um, with some of the local casinos and hotels there. So that's also appealing, I would imagine, for you know a family yes, comes there. Not everybody in that family likes to fish, but the one person that does. They can go see the shows, lose a little money, uh, all that right. stuff, and you can take them out for a, a day's fishing on Pyramid or two days fishing, or or they don't see their family for the entire Reno trip. <laughs> right, 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 right. So we have two different packages. So the first package, like we're we're, we're headquartered out of Pyramid Lake Lodge, right. So our literal headquarters is at the lake in Sutcliffe in conjunction in partnership with pyramid lake lodge so we're on their property our guys sleep there they eat there we have our gear there we prep there we park there the whole kit and caboodle so that's option one we have the lodge if you want to stay on the lake and have that lake experience you know maybe you're a little bit that that's what you want you just you want to fish talk to nobody or maybe just talk to your buddy and and do that we have that, and that's always been there. Our newest option is we have a package with Caesars Entertainment. 
um, specifically the row in Reno. So there's three casinos. You got, you got Silver Legacy, Circus Circus, and El Dorado. So what we have there is we have packages to where you could go there and you have a pretty, actually really incredible nightly rate. We have a private reservation agent for that. So you have one person you talk to when you want to make your reservation, you got, you call Michelle, you call Michelle and Michelle will set you up with wherever you want to stay forever. How long? Um, 23 restaurants because all the, all the casinos are um, linked together by a big mezzanine area. You got 23, 23 restaurants, 23 dining areas. You got all the gaming, you have shows, you have the town. Um, And I think another cool key feature about that is if you're flying in, like, like Phil, you're flying in from Alberta. Yeah, you could land at Reno Tahoe International Airport with all your crap, right? You got bags up the, you know, you're coming out just a hot mess. Yeah, and here comes a shuttle. Boop, boop, boop. Here comes a shuttle, and it says the row on the side. They run a shuttle every 15 minutes that'll pick you up at the airport at no charge and take you to the casino. If you need a rent a car, guess what? The casino gets you a rent a car. There it is. It's another aspect of that show up blow up. And it works great, especially like it, no matter what time of the year, but, you know, especially like this time of year, like February, March, April, May, June, we have longer days and our full day trips are eight hours, right? So this time of year, we're going to start you at six. You're, you're off the water, you know, between two and three o'clock, depending, you know, and what are you going to do with the rest of the time? You know, a lot of people say, I want to fish more. But the wise choice is literally get off the water. <laughs> <laughs> You get get off the water yeah. and go reset, you know. So this is a cool option to where people want to go in town. They can go in and, you know, take the shower, go have a nice dinner, go game. If there happens to be some type of show, they could go see the show. The casino will take care of them and then rinse and repeat. So you get the great outdoor experience and then you have, you know, you could get pampered to whatever level you want in town. So that's a great, that's a great package. It's a fantastic package. Yeah. I got the uh, Sutcliffe experience, which is unique because the the, lo- the lodge out there is pretty cool. Lots of character, uh, lots of pictures on the wall, lots of memorabilia. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Unique. And you you had cabin four, which you, you open your door and you look at the lake. You're like, Reep. yeah, there's yeah. the lake. Yeah, it was a cute little cabin. It was great. You just threw me out the door of your vehicle, and I'll see you in the morning. And off you went. So it was great. It was great. Well, Nico, this has been great. This has been. Uh, hopefully, we've whetted some appetite about coming to pyramid and, and people to come and spend time with you and pyramid fly company. Um, mm-hmm. It's a little different for me because you mentioned Bearfish Alliance. I've been on your podcast a, a few times. <laughs> so uh, yeah. hopefully this uh, shoe on the other foot experience wasn't too bad for you. As I learn my way through this podcasting game, it's kind of fun. It's just good to sit and talk. This is like you and I having a phone call and, and just catching up. So, so I how, love it. Yeah. How can people learn more about, uh, Pyramid Lake and uh, and especially Pyramid Fly Company. So real easy. Uh, website pyramidflyco.com. Spell it just like it sounds. Pyramid and F L Y and then C O then dot com. Right. Even I can spell that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. I have problems. I have to write it in crayon. That's the ongoing joke because I'm a marine, right? Yeah. yeah give them the crayons. You said it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I just put it out there before anybody else does. So. Um, and hey, by the way, remember the crayons aren't for writing either. They're for eating. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so <laughs> that's, so that's where I'm coming from. So bear with me, Phil. All yeah. right. So on, um, so on no. your website, they got all the information about Pyramid Fly Company, the lake, how to book a trip, everything they need is yep. there, one stop yep. shop. You guys are also active on social media too. You've got Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we're we are on Instagram. Um, we are on the face space. Um, this is the Facebook. So, I mean, anything that goes on Instagram, you know, it goes on Facebook. So these are all great things. So we, we try to connect the best way we can with what we have. So social media is, is, you know, like the Instagram is a big one. We like during the height of the season, you'll always see updates, you know, you'll see happy clients. You'll see, you'll see results, you know, from the day or the week or whatnot. Um, we try to keep people up to date as well. We do have a newsletter, which if you're interested at all in Pyramid Lake, this is a great newsletter. You go to the pyramidflyco.com and no effort required. The first thing that pops up is going to ask you to sign up for a newsletter. You put your email in there and we do all kinds of great things 
on that newsletter, I'll have lake conditions. So I'll tell you like how we feel about the lake, you know, so what to, what to wear, you know, what it's been like, what to expect, how the roads are, just basics. And then I have an interactive weather map. You click a tab. What's the weather actually like? You click on it, it tells you, right? Cool. Um, I do a fish report on there and the fish reports also on the website. Fish report, fish gallery with all the cool catches. I do product highlights, you know, so whatever the product of that week is, whatever. Hey, and it's stuff that we use. So we give you good feedback like, hey, we use this. We like it. This is how we feel about it. If you're interested in it, click that button and it takes you to wherever that product is located. Um, podcast, you know, we'll have a podcast link on there or video links. Um, and then our lodging information. We did speak briefly about the lodging. You'll find that on the bottom of every newsletter. So it's not a junky, crappy, weird, trying to sell you a bunch of stuff type of newsletter, you know, that, that we're all accustomed to. It's just, it's genuine fun information. So if you want to learn more, please sign up for that. Look for us on Instagram, Pyramid Fly Co. Um, if you're interested in a trip, all the information's there. All our rates are on there. All the different kinds of trips, you know, day trip, two day, three day, group trip, trophy pursuit trip. Hell, we'll make a trip up for you. You know, he got an well, idea. You, you guys do do other lakes in the area too, don't you? you uh... No, right now we just do, we just do Pyramid Lake. But, you know, we, we are talking, you know, like, like hosted trips and stuff. You know, we do have a hosted trip offering on there. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, so that's stuff to look for. We're, we're dabbling in that. Pyramid's a big enough and beautiful, beautiful enough lake. It's, you know, but to keep us busy in the summer, we need some kind of cool, fun adventure. So I also noticed recently you've started a YouTube channel as well. Um, some, <laughs> some video footage on there that gives, you know, for me, it was a, a great way to go back and have a look and, and relive some of my experiences down there. So that's another good place for something. Yeah, thank, no, thank you for bringing that up because most of our stuff has been going on like the social media and the website. So we just kind of re relaunched the, uh, the YouTube channel and we have, um three videos on there right now uh one's been kicking around for a little bit with an updated edit on it the two others are pretty new um they're great one covers a bobber clinic that we did uh the other one which one did we put up without giving away what the other one is but the other one's great too <laughs> and then i think within this week or the next week we'll have the other one up and they're all short they're relatively short films so like you're not burning a bunch of time you know they're no more than like three minutes but they capture so much so much of what's going on out there gives you a really great feel for who the guides are, what the lake's like, what it looks like, and what's going on. They're fun. Yeah, they're really cool. You mentioned the Bobber Clinic. What's that all about? Oh, man. <laughs> the, the, the Bobber Clinic is awesome. The Bobber Clinic's awesome. So this year we did two. We did one early season, and um, generally we always do them in early season. We try to get in front of the season, so hopefully we could spin people up on – their skills and whatnot heading into it. So we did the first one and we felt like we wanted to do a second one. And we did it. We did it the first week of February and the turnout was fantastic. We had, I think we had 13, we had 13 turnout for it. So we had all of our guides on deck. We had 13 people come out. We had a, a local fly shop come out, Mark Thorne strike. So Dave and skinny came out. Um, we had Rio fly lines come out. Alex came out with the van and brought all kinds of stuff out. And then, you know, so ultimately at the end of the clinic, we probably had on water, like 17 people. Oh, cool. And, and, and some of these folks were, um, you know, wanted to up their game. You know, they, maybe they already knew how to roll cast or, you know, had an idea they get to sharpen their skills. I think the best story out of it, we had one guy that never fly fish before and never fished a lake before so he was like a spin guy on the river and he comes out to the lake and the first place that we take him worst conditions possible the wind's blowing in our face and everything and he's out there he learns his cast he's the first one to catch a fish out of the whole group so first one to catch a fish first fish on a fly rod first time fly fishing and this is all within 15 minutes of being on the water. 15 minutes, he was roll casting. And that 15 minutes, he learned how to set the hook. He learned how to strip. You know, he had one of the guides by his side sitting there coaching him through it. They got it to the net. Hmm. They got it to the net on a switch rod. First time, wind in his face. Like, I'm making a big deal about it. But first time fly fishing for anybody, people lose their, lose their crap 
on a green lawn on a windless day trying to cast, learning to cast. This kid comes out. There's 25 mile power wind in his face. <laughs> and it's like, where's like, yeah, this is how it is, man. Like, do this and this and this. And he's out there. And then, hey, my bobber's gone. He'll pinch that line and pull up. <laughs> Boom. He got that's, a fish. That's you know? cool. That is so cool. But, yeah, it, it's wonderful. And, and we're looking forward to doing, you know, um, more of that in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Well, is there anything? Oh, yeah, we do, we do that. Sorry, Nico, is there anything else you want to say? Have I missed anything? Anything you want to tell people about Pyramid Lake, Pyramid Fly Company, yourself? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we've covered a lot in this. I'm sure there's a lot we forgot, but all I can say is Pyramid Lake um, is a wonderful experience. It's really, it's a magical and mystical place. It It gets you, and you can't truly understand it until you get there. Um Pyramid Flyco, if you are going to come out, come out with us. I can't say it enough. Come out with us. You'll have a great time. And even if you're planning a multi-day trip, and even if you're an experienced angler and you think you can figure it out, man, put that ego aside. Come out and let us walk you through it. Let us baby you through it. Get that first day on the books and go off and do what you want. But guaranteed you'll have a great time. We'll take that big bite out of that learning curve, you know, because everyone everyone's down here for a while until they get up here. You'll sit down here for a long time. Let's move you up onto that incline. I strongly agree with that because it is such a unique fishery between the ladders, you know, the the landscape, you know, the the, the sheer mass, the volume of water out there. And you guys know where to go, which beaches to go at certain times of the year. You're in touch with it all the time. And even if you just invested one day with you guys, it would just be uh, it would make the rest of your trip, you know, it, nothing worse than going on a seven or eight day trip and catching one fish the entire trip while you could have had, you know, multiple days. It happens all the time, Phil. I hear, I hear the story all the time and look, look, we're out there all the time. My guides are out there all the time. If they're not guiding, they actually do take the time to go fish. I know. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. And I'm talking about in between days. I mean, they'll take the opportunity, you know, like, after a client day, they'll test things out, whatever. But even their off days, they'll be like, like you and I, we had, uh, we had Morgan yeah. one day, you know, that was, you know, that was his time. And he came out and he wanted to fish with us because well, one, he wanted to fish with Phil, come on out, <laughs> you know, but, but two, it's like, Hey, he's got clients the next day. You know, what happened two days ago, isn't going to be relevant when his clients show up, Yeah, you know, so you got to go out and test the water. So everyone gets on the water, everyone, everyone's, got their finger on the pulse out there and you can't beat that you just can't beat it it's just it's yeah so yeah come out experience it come out experience it with us go to our website all of our contact information's there um and listen to phil, <laughs> phil, phil i've learned i have to say this i've learned so much and I, i'm gonna blow some smoke up oh, here you know what here phil <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Fanboy time. Look out. <laughs> you look out. Now, now I'm feeling you know, uncom I, I, now I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> now you're uncomfortable. Well, I'm just saying, I can tell your listeners that the techniques that fill you, that Phil practices on, on the daily, on the water, are, are extremely relevant. And they're extremely relevant at Pyramid with the way that you set up your leader, the way that you do the, the swivel and, you know, and the bobber and, and everything like that. Um, I can say I've saved a lot of missed fish because of of those setups and stuff so thank you for that but those that crosses all the boundaries of still water still water still water when it comes to that presentation you know we might have some slight variances here and there but um all in all like i would be in a much crappier place if i didn't learn things from you um the bugs are different though <laughs> our, bug, our bug tying it's it's i love it because like your, your bug tying Man, you have to appeal to so many different, like those rainbows and the cutthroats and stuff. They, they like, man, they get picky and they have all this stuff to choose from. I think we're spoiled to where we have good food sources, but we can narrow it down. We're like, yeah. it's either a small coronamid or a big one, <laughs> or a dark, or a cat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or it's a, or it's a caddis maybe, or a dragonfly, or um, you know, there are some there's scuds out there, but there are plenty of that. So it's like we have this smaller window to work with, but within that smaller window the variations make a huge difference. I can tell it from the guy next to me to what I'm using. I'm like, guy next to me has been fishing all day. I've caught 15 fish and this guy's caught one. <laughs> so, 
your lessons go a long way out there. Well, thank you. Well, Nico, thanks yes, for sir. joining me. Um, it was great to have thanks you on. It me. seemed only appropriate since um, you had me <laughs> on your podcast, and, and that podcast is the Bearfish Alliance podcast, so check it out. And uh, thanks once again. It was uh, your passion and love for Pyramid and what you do certainly shines through. And uh, we'll have all that information in the show notes, website, links, and hopefully some people will come out to Pyramid and uh, spend time with Pyramid Fly Company and, and get to share that passion that you have. So thanks so much for joining me. I don't have any special burrito questions. <laughs> no burrito questions. Sorry. Hey, all I can say, I, I, I got to give, your, I gotta give your, your listeners a quick challenge, though. Yeah. Look. You got to beat Phil's record out there because I want to keep Phil coming out and catching big fish. Yeah. So you feel like you did it, it just quicked up before we go. Yeah. You caught what it was a, like a 10 and a 15. Like you caught two, two nice fish in a yeah. row, but you don't see it every day. Like your first full day on the water, like a couple hours into it, you got, you know, that, that 15 pound fish incredible so i challenge anybody to come out <laughs> and, and repeat kick my butt exercise. come out and kick my butt <laughs> kick, kick his butt yeah kick his butt no no it was it was great to see you do that that was i couldn't ask for anything more like you know one to have you out that was awesome but you got on the right fish and that was cool and that's an experience i love everybody to have regardless of the size fish they catch out there because they're all great size fish yeah. um coming out and do it it's fun have a blast pyramid flyco we lead the way out there. Come on, join us. Have fun. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much, Nico. Take care. Thanks, and, Phil. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time on the Littoral Zone. That was Phil Roy on the Littoral Zone, part of the Wet Fly Swing podcast and Swing Outdoors. Want to give Phil a big thank you and for putting this one together. Amazing. This has been a great chance for us to connect and dig a little bit deeper into Stillwater. If you have a question for the show on Stillwater for Phil, you can send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com or connect with Phil anytime at flycraftangling.com and uh, social media, anything you do, we'd all be loving to hear from you if you get a chance. And uh, and this has been awesome. We are continuing to roll along. We're, tr- we're planning on doing these about one every month all year long. Uh, So if you're loving this, uh, definitely let Phil know. We would love to hear from you right now. If you're listening and you enjoyed this, a little tweak on the normal thing we have. Uh, If you're loving the littoral zone, the best way to keep this going is to let Phil or I know that you're loving it. That's how we're going to do this potentially for another year. And, uh, And if you have feedback either way, let us know and it would be amazing. Excited to see you on that next episode of this littoral zone.